By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Tibby Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we're going to enjoy an old school magic match where I am playing against Yoop. And Yoop is bringing a Setch Troll Armageddon deck to the table that he's called Setch Geddon. And uh, it's kind of odd, right? Setch Troll in an Armageddon deck. So it's, uh, it's going to be quite interesting. It's white and red with a little bit of a black splash purely to get the Setch Trolls plus one plus one and regeneration story going. And I am playing with a deck that I'm actually quite excited about. I've called it the Dwarven Workshop. It is a brand new deck where I play with a card that I've always wanted to play with, Dwarven Weaponsmith. So I'm just really looking forward to show you this brew. Now, before we jump into the deck decks, there's one thing I would like to mention, and that is that, as always, you can also jump this video. You can go to the deck decks or you can go to the game straight away if you want to, and you can do that by using the timestamps. They are in the description below. So, for example, if you want to go to the game straight away, simply find the description of this video and click on the timestamp that reads MTG Games, and that will take you to the games instantly, and you can just skip the whole introduction but I would advise you to stick around at least for the deck deck section of uh, the Dwarven Workshop because, uh, yeah, if I say so myself, it is something to behold. Anyway, uh, let's start with the deck decks. We're going to start with the deck of my opponent, Joop Vak, and his uh, Sech Genon deck. And here we see the deck of Joop. So it's kind of a pink weenie ish build, right? There are no Iron Claw Orcs in here, though. Instead of Iron Claw Orcs, he's going for Sech Trolls. So four lines, four granite gargoyles, and four Setch Trolls. And then he combines that with Armageddon, right? So you're going to play out your cheaper creatures. Um, and then you're going to play out your Armageddon quite quickly, making sure that your opponent doesn't have any mana anymore and you have more creatures on the board. And you can just, you know, keep attacking him and deal a lot of damage. So basically this deck goes for kind of a shorter game. But there are a couple of odd things going on in this deck. Because um, if you're going for this aggro plan, why then are you playing with three Jam Day Tomes? Exactly, three Jam Day Tomes. So that's quite a lot, right? He's also playing with Felwer Stones, Sol Ring, and uh, the Mox. And obviously that goes together quite well with the Armageddons. But uh, it seems to be a bit counterproductive playing with Armageddon to get rid of all the lands and then playing with three Jam Day Tomes. Remember, Jam Day Tome is fantastic, but it usually uh, is played in a more control shell because it's four and tap for one card. So usually when you play a Jam Day Tome, you're in it for, for the long run. So that's quite an interesting thing. So I'm really curious to see how that is going to work out. Uh, also, we see four Setch Trolls. Now, Setch Troll, of course, is a good creature. It's a cheap creature. But with Setch Troll is you need a black mana for it to become a 3-3 and to be able to regenerate it for that one black, right? Or else it's just a 2-2 creature for 3 that does nothing, which is not really good, okay? Then there are a lot better options. So it, it, it's quite an interesting combination. Now, it's not going to be a real problem for my opponent to find the black mana because he's playing with Scrubland and with Badlands. So those are both dual lands that have a black source. So in total, he's playing with eight swamps, you could say. So eight cards that are going to activate the Setch Troll. Another thing with Setch Troll is, and I think people that play Setch Troll know this, is when are you going to play the Setch Troll? Are you going to take the risk and play it with only three mana because then you won't have any mana open to regenerate it? Or are you going to uh, wait and play it after you have at least one black mana open to regenerate it. Now, these are all options that don't really necessarily go hand in hand with the other side of this deck, which is the more pink weenie aggro, right? The lightning bolts, the savannah line, the gargoyle, right? You want to play out those creatures fast, put early pressure on. And then the Sechtral seems to be a bit of a slower, more mid-game strategy. The same thing goes for the Jam Day Tome. So I'm just really curious to see how this is going to pan out. I think the way that Yoop is going to play it is not as an aggressive deck, but more as a control deck. And I'm honestly just really curious to see how that's going to go. And then uh, we can also have a little look at the sideboard because there are three cards in here that I'd like to point out in this matchup. And they're called the Mountain Yeti. So Mountain Yeti, two uh, red and two for a 3-3 three, three Summon Yeti with Mountain Walk and protection from white. Now, the protection from white is not really going to be relevant in this matchup, although it is relevant in a lot of matchups because there are so many sorts to plowshares 
going around in old school. So this card is quite good and I think still a little bit underplayed in the sideboards. Uh, but I think it's going to be quite good in this matchup because I'm playing with mountains. So it's basically unblockable uh, against me. So I'm, I'm wondering if he's going to board it in. It'll also work really nicely with the Blood Moons that are in his sideboard. I'm actually playing Blood Moons main, so he may not even have to board them in. But I think Blood Moon against me is a decent card. Obviously, Blood Moon is a big problem, though, uh, for Yoop when we look at his mana base, right? For starters, he'll ruin all his swamps. So that means that all his set trolls will only be 2 twos as long as Blood Moons are in the game. So it may not be for his best interests interest uh, uh, to board the Blood Moons in. So I'm going to be curious to see if he's going to use those Yates after our uh, first game. He's definitely going to board in that Disenchant, I think, against me. Anyway, this is the deck of Yupvak. Now let's take a look at my deck, Dwarven Workshop. And here we see my deck, the Dwarven uh, Workshop, and I'm just really excited about this deck for several reasons. I guess the first reason is that it is a Tron deck, and I always love to play with Tron. It is super difficult in, in old school magic in the sense that if you really want it to work, it is hard work because there's no way to find these strong lands like you can do in other magic formats. You just have to draw into them. And yes, you can have some card draw and some minimal selection, but it's really, really tough. So that means that you have to have a plan before you have Tron. Now, a second reason why I really like this deck is the fact that I am get to play with Dwarven Weaponsmith. Now, Dwarven Weaponsmith, look at that art. It's just a beautiful creature. And I think what it does, it's just so flavorful and the art and everything just kind of comes together. The card makes sense. It's one red and one for a 1-1 one, one Summon Dwarves. Beautiful art by Mark Poole from the Antiquities expansion. You can tap it only during your upkeep, unfortunately. But what it does is you can add a permanent plus one plus one counter to any creature. And each time you use this ability, you must choose one of your artifacts in play and place it in the graveyard. Now, that is why this card is in a deck with five Moxen, because I'm going to use those Moxen for the Dwarven Weaponsmith to make plus one plus one counters off. Basically, he's making weapons out of diamonds, and he's going to give that to the creatures in my deck. And of course, the creatures in my deck are particularly good with plus one plus one counters because I'm playing with Tetravus and Triskelion. Now for Triskelion, he can shoot one one counters off to deal one damage to any target. So it's like giving him an extra bullet to shoot. So I just like that flavor, right? The Dwarven Weaponsmith gets a mox, changes that into an extra bullet and gives that to the Triskelion. But there's even something cooler that he can do. He can change a mox into a one one flyer be because there is the creature Tetravus in this deck. So Tetravus, a 4-4 flyer from Antiquities, actually a 1-1 flyer that comes in with three plus one plus one counters and during your upkeep you can take plus one plus one counters off how many you want, it doesn't matter, and you can also put them back on by the way, but every time you take a counter off it's turned into a 1-1 flying Tetravite. So you can have a scenario here where Dwarven Weaponsmith makes an artifact into a plus one plus one counter, puts it on the Tetravite, and then Tetravite can take it off and make it into a 1-1 flyer. I mean, that's just really cool, isn't it? So that is kind of my dream in this matchup, that I get to use the Weaponsmith, and I, you know, I kind of get to show you how this works with the Triskelion and the Tetravus. Now, another really cool thing in here um, is that there's a Candelabra of Taunus in here, and there's a Mana Flare in here, right? Candelabra of Taunus, one to cast for this artifact, where X untap and X amount of lands. Now, if you can tap your lands for two mana or three mana, because you've got Tron online, you can actually use one land to untap two lands so you can kind of net extra mana. Now, this works really well with Mana Flare as well, because Mana Flare gives you an extra mana every time you tap a land, right? So that's why you also have decks like Candle Flare. You could say this is kind of like a Candle Flare light. Now, there's another really cool card that I'd like to discuss in this deck, and that's Taunus' Coffin. So Taunus' Coffin is a card from the Antiquities as well. You can pay three and tap it and put target creature in the coffin. Then it's considered exiled from play. But the cool thing is, while it's in the coffin, it's taking all the auras attached to it. It's taking all the counters. It's taking it with it. And then when you untap the coffin during your uh, untap step, the creature in the coffin is coming back. So you can choose not to untap it. But if you do untap it, the creature in the coffin comes back into play tapped. But all the ETB triggers, they go off again. So that means when you've got a Tetravus in the coffin, when it comes back into play, it gets an additional three plus one plus one counters and it doesn't lose any of the counters that it had when it went in the coffin. So Taunus' coffin goes together really well with Triskelion, Tetravus, but also with Clockwork Avian, because I'm also playing a Clockwork Avian. So I'm just 
really pumped. I'm really excited for this deck. I haven't been so excited about a deck in, in a long while. This is going to be my second match with this deck. Um, I don't have a victory yet, so I'm hoping it's going to happen against Yubwak. I am a little bit nervous, though, about the Armageddons, because this, this deck really needs mana. Uh, you know, I, I guess the silver lining is that I am playing with all the Moxen, um, and of course, Soul Ring, so I've got some other ways to get mana, but I really need my mana base here, because as you can see, a lot of my cards have four, are costing four mana or up, so I really need the mana. So you please don't play too many Armageddons, okay? Please, just let me do my thing, just for this once. Anyway, I guess it's time to go to the match and find out. Let's go to the Dwarven Workshop versus Satch Geddon. Game number one, here we go. So I'm sitting on the right with my Dwarven Workshop deck and uh, my opponent, Yupvak, is sitting on the left with his Setch Troll Armageddon deck. So white and red with some dual lands that also produce black mana to activate the Setch Troll. Let's have a look here. Okay, this is my hand. Ooh, I've got Dwarven Weaponsmith and I got a Mox a Ruby. I mean, the hand's not great, but I can play Dwarven Weaponsmith turn one. Here's the hand of my opponent. There you go. Okay, Fireball. Okay, it's pretty good. Lightning Bolt. It's not a fast hand though, but it's okay. He's got Granite Gargoyle there, 2-2 Flyer for three. That's pretty decent. Starting here with the tower, and here we go, turn one, Dwarven Weaponsmith! Oh, <laughs> love it! Yes, yes! I guess this is already a success. Now let's hope that I can get one of my counter creatures on the table so I can start using the Dwarven Weaponsmith What it's for. Oh, that's brutal. I actually didn't expect my opponent to bolt a Weaponsmith, in all honesty. But anyway, ooh, look at this, missing a land drop. So I only had the tower and the ruby in hand. Maybe I should have shuffled it away, but I really wanted to make that turn one play with the Weaponsmith. We see a Mishra's Factory by Yupier. And just to pass again, this is very unfortunate. So this game one had an explosive start for me, but that was about it. Now he can cast that Gargoyle that we saw in his opening hand. There it is, Granite Gargoyle. So starting next turn, he can start putting some pressure on. But I've got that Bolt, I think, in hand, right? Okay, Bolting the Gargoyle, cleaning up the mess a little bit, but I really need Lance here. And again, a pass. This is painful. The only good thing here is that Yoop hasn't found a Disenchant yet to take care of my uh, Mox Ruby. I think if he finds that, it's pretty much a, a game already. He's finding another land. There's a Scrub land. Can he find a Setch Troll? There is a Jam Tome all the way there on the left. Okay, he's putting a little bit more on the screen here. So Jam Day Tome, four and tap to draw a card and also four to cast. So starting next turn, he can get some card advantage in. Okay, finding a Mishra's Factory, tapping three. I think I had a Blood Moon in hand and my opener. Okay, there's a Blood Moon. This is pretty sweet because my opponent now doesn't have access anymore to any white mana. But of course, he still has the book. He's playing with some basic planes. So as soon as he finds the basic planes, he's fine again. I'm untapping here. Tapping three again. What can I cast? Mana Flare. Wow. That is, I mean, Mana Flare is kind of nuts because my opponent has the book, right? So Mana Flare makes the book a lot better. But it's probably my only way out of this mess. Remember, I have a huge land issue this entire game. And the only good thing for me is that I'm still on 20 because basically I've done nothing except cast a Dwarf and a Weaponsmith and a Bolt. So, you know, only two lands played so far. So it's really a horrible start for me. Let's just see if my what my opponent can do. He's definitely going to draw a card, I think, but maybe he wants to do it in my end step. He's now got a lot of options. Remember, five lands equals 10 mana. So... They're all, no, they're not all red because he's also found his basic plane. So he can basically do whatever he wants. And okay, playing a granite gargoyle. So that means he's got one red floating. Tapping some more mana to use the book. Still one red floating and two, okay, just playing a Savannah Lines. I thought maybe he was gonna play another gargoyle. So two creatures on the board. So that means some pressure from his side. 
And hopefully I can find another land. That means six mana. Six is a pretty important number for me because I'm playing Triskelion and Tetravis. Oh, Candelabra of Tana. So that's maybe one of the reasons why I played out the Mana Flare. So I'm creating four mana. Then I'm tapping the Candelabra, taking two out to untap. So I still have two mana floating and I can tap my lands. That means I've got six. Am I going to cast a Trike? If I cast a Trike, I can actually kill both of his creatures here. So that's definitely what I'm hoping for. It looks like I'm a little bit in the tank here, so I guess I don't have a trike, or else I would do that like bum bum bum. I think I've got something else. And what's coming right now? Okay, there's the Clockwork Avian. So Clockwork Avian is 5 to cast. It's an 0-4 creature that comes in the game with 4 plus 1 plus 0 counters. So it's actually a 4-4 creature. When I attack or when it blocks, it loses one of those counters. And in the upkeep, I can choose to tap it to put new counters on it. Not sure why I'm putting three counters on it, to be honest. It's a 4-4. Four, four. So just to clarify, there should be four counters on here. Maybe I'm thinking it's a 1-4 or something. Probably because I'm so used from the trike and the tetravis to just put three counters on. That's why I'm doing it. Ooh, there's the swords to plowshares. Doesn't mean I'm gaining four lives. So I'm going to go up to 24, but he's probably going to attack me. So there's that life there. Ooh, he's gonna bold me. Does that mean that's not a good sign? Does he maybe have a wheel of fortune? Actually, that would be pretty cool. If he's got a wheel, he probably wants to wheel first before he attacks. Is that smart? I mean, I'm tapped out. Yeah, I think that's smart. If he's got a wheel, I would kind of play it out now. So let's see what he can do. I was really hoping for a Triskelion. That would have been so good. Also because my opponent didn't have any uh, red mana open to pump the toughness of the Gargoyle at the time. It was completely tapped out. But unfortunately for me, I couldn't find a Trike. I found that Avian instead. And that could quickly sort to Plowshared. Remember my opponent still has... Yeah, there's the Wheel of Fortune. Still has uh, three disenchants in hand. Look at that. Oh, man. It is a good hand, though. Oh, man. That is bad. The Taunus' Coffin is so good in my deck, and I only got one copy. It's gone now. Maybe I should play with the Felden's Cane. Maybe I should. Anyway, also losing this Integrate. I'm playing one Disintegrate and one Fireball in my deck. And these, of course, are great cards if you've got your uh, your Mana Flare and your Candelabra of Taunus online, which I actually do right now. There's a new Savannah Lines by my opponent here. He can swing in for 4. I'm on 21 at the moment. He can put me on 17. Yeah, I think he's going to do that, right? He's going to swing in. I'm going to drop to 17. Ah, oh, man. At least I've got 7 in hand, so hopefully he's just going to let me pass. If I find a land together with Candelabra, I can make tons of mana. There we see a Felwer Stone. That's not all too threatening. So putting that Candelabra back. Okay, let's play out a land. Let's start with playing out a land. Okay, there's another Mox that's also fine, but let's get the land. Okay, there's the land. Good, because now I can tap for six. Right? So I'm probably going to get the dice again. I'm going to tap for six mana. I can untap again. That means I, I keep three mana and I get to untap my land. So this is really a nice um, display of how you can use your Candelabra with your Mana Flare, right? How it actually works. Demonstration, I, sh I should say, not a display. Display is something else. Anyway, uh, okay, casting six. Oh, Shivan Dragon! Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is pretty sweet. Shivan Dragon, I love it. Papa Shivan coming to town here together with an IC manipulator and I've got my mocks open to actually use my IC next turn as well. So this is great news for me. Hopefully my opponent doesn't have a Swords to Plowshare. Ah, oh, man. Come on. Give me a break. This is, this is Swords to Plowshares. This is such an annoying card. It also removes your creature. I know I'm whining a little bit, but I was just so happy seeing this turn putting, you know... A Sheevan Dragon on board because I've got my Candelabra Mana Flare combination going. That is what you want to do in life, right? That is what you want to do. But 
Yeah, that's why Swords is just the best removal in the game. Quickly took care of that Sheevan Dragon. And now let's see what my opponent can do. He still has the book, so he's got card advantage. He's got three creatures on the board. I can tap one at least with my Icy Manipulator. That's what I'm going to do right now. So I'm going to tap one of the creatures, the Gargoyle. Going to take four points of damage. Going to go down to 18. I wonder if I took the life from the Sheevan Dragon, by the way. I think I didn't. Because if I would have taken the life, I would have been up now still. Because I was on 21, I believe. So from 21 with 4 damage to 18, that's correct, is it? No, then it should have been on 17. I have no idea at this point. Anyway, I thought I was higher in life and maybe I forgot to add the Sheevan Dragon uh, life. Anyway, my bad. Um, tapping 8 mana now. Going to use the Candelabra again. So that means I've got 4 mana left. Plus I can tap my Lance again. So I've got 12 mana at my disposal. Tapping the four, there is a Jam Day Tome. That is good news. Using the Tome to draw a card immediately, that is pretty bad news because it means I don't have any other options. I really need to find that Trike because the Trike could really help me at least take care of the Lions. Okay, there's a Tetravus. Okay, not as great as a Trike, but the Tetravus can at least block the Granite Gargoyle. Here we can see my opponent. Oh, he's got two books now. I kind of missed that one. He's got two books. What? He's drawing two cards a turn? Oh man, this is bad. This is really bad. This is, uh, yeah. This is not good. I mean, he's been having so much card advantage. Then again, I kind of feel lucky that I'm still in this game because remember how I started with just the mocks and the land and then I wasn't able to do anything for like three turns and I'm still not dead. So that's kind of the positive. I think that um, the analysis that I made during the deck deck that Yoop was going to play this as a control player, that's definitely spot on. There we see a Setch Troll, the Setch Troll we should say. Of course it's just a 2-2 because of that Blood Moon. He's going to draw another card. I mean, he's just drawing so many cards. This is brilliant for him, but so bad for me. If he can find a Disenchant, play a Disenchant on my book, he'll get even more advantage. To be honest, I think that's what I would do in his in his uh, case. And now he's attacking with everything. I'm completely tapped out. Of course, his set troll still has summoning sickness. I mean, if he has a bolt and I block a line and he then bolts, you know, so that's probably why I'm taking the damage here. I'm afraid of a bolt. Because if, if, if I eat a bolt, it's a really bad trade for me. And next turn, of course, I can take off the, uh, the counters and make 1-1 one, one flyers which is actually not really a bad option for me. At least I should take off one, make it a 3-3 so it can block the gargoyle. Ooh, taking them all off. Maybe I've got plans. Of course, I do have that um, Icy Manipulator, but I think I should have just taken off one, to be honest. So Tron's online, but not really. So I'm making 10 mana and tapping it again. So I've got five mana left. And I'm going to use the book for four. So that's just the bonus mana, right? So I've got one mana floating still. And like I said, I think I should have just taken off one, one, one flyer. Unless I have got some kind of bigger idea. Oh, there's a trike. That is kind of nice. I've got a trike now coming in with three plus one plus one counters that I can shoot at any direction. I should really kill the granite gargoyle right now. Because Yoop doesn't have any red open to pump the toughness. And I'm kind of feeling that I'm, I'm slowly getting back into this game. I'm feeling confident. Exactly. I'm killing the Gargoyle. I think that's a very good decision. And I don't have to do anything yet, of course, with that other counter. I think I'm playing this quite well. The only mistake I made, in my opinion, looking at the board state, not knowing what's in my hand is, like I said, I should have kept two counters on the Tetravis, making it a 3-3. Three, three. Then it could block a Setch Troll or a Lion without any problems and then it would still have a 1-1 flyer too if I wanted to simply block a line. You could even say that I should keep all the counters on because now it's boltable and when it's a 3-3 it's also boltable so it's yeah. Then again now it's better protected against the disenchant. There, there, there I guess there, there are reasons uh, for, for this move but I don't really like it. I think I should have made it into a 3-3. Anyway 
Um, Yupir playing a strip mine that still comes in as a mountain. Remember, the Blood Moon is still in the game. I should remove the dice, by the way, that says one, because that's still the one mana I've got left from the previous turn, but I can just take it away. So my opponent really, really into tank here. He's got so much options. He's got tons of mana. If, if he draws his fireball, I'm dead. There is a disenchant on the Blood Moon. Why does he do that? That means his Sech Trolls are turning into 3-3 three, three creatures now. And for one black, he can regenerate them. And he's got black mana. He also has um, the, uh, the factories that are active. Oh, man, there's going to be an Alpha Strike. This is really bad. There is a strip mine. He's going to take care of one of the lands. It doesn't really matter which one, actually. I guess... Okay, so he's going to take care of that because now Tron's back online without the Blood Moon. So he's taking away my Tron. I think the factory could have been an option as well. So I'm tapping one of the creatures. What I could potentially do here is block one Savannah line with my trike and kill the other with my trike. That is, of course, an option. This is kind of tricky. He's got black mana open to regenerate, so it's really tough. I'm on 12. I don't want to take too much damage. And here you see me kind of dividing the tokens so that I kill as much as possible. So I'm killing the two lines right now. I could choose to maybe block the factory, kill it with the counter on the trike still, and I could then also double block another factory. That is an option. I mean, I've got no way to get the counters back. Well, the Tonsus Coffin I have in my deck, but it's already in the graveyard. So these are just going to be 1-1 one, one creatures. That's it. This is tough. This is really tough. So you see me changing all the time, trying to find a way. The reason is I don't want to get too low because I know he's playing with bolts and playing with, with, well, I don't know how many fireballs, but I'm assuming he actually is only playing with one fireball, but I didn't know that at the time. So I was assuming his deck had at least two fireball in it. So I was being quite cautious. I think, yeah, looking back at this block, yeah, I don't know. If I would have just kept a Tetravis as a as a 4-4, I think it would have been better. Or at least a 3-3. Three, three, but, but okay, I've discussed that at length already. So it's got one damage. That's why I'm putting the die on there. Because, you know, maybe I still want to use the try counter. Remember, damage stays until the cleanup step. So I've got the entire turn to still shoot it down if I want to. Uh, you know, I've got no rush. And now he's going to draw his two extra cards. That's just insane. For two mana, finding a card and you can use it again. Finding a Mox here. And here I'm pointing out at the factory. I completely forgot the Mishra's factory in that block, by the way, because I put it with my lands. That's a stupid mistake. And they were, of course, the factory was a mountain until that disenchant, and then it turned back into a factory. And that factory could have done great work for me in the block, because I could have blocked... Uh, one of the other factories made it a 3-3 and kill his other factory. Then he would lose both of his factories in the exchange, which is like a considerable upside for me. So kind of some sloppy play on my side here. But anyway, I'm still on 10, so I've got some possibilities. My brother here is still playing, though, really in the tank, I think. Okay, there is the ping. So this is end step. And uh, yeah, at least at least I still have the book. I got tons of mana. Uh, I got the book. I've got the Candelabra. So there's hope for me still. And the Candelabra, of course, is really nice with uh, Mishra's Factory as well because I can untap my own factory to, to pump it an additional time, which is really nice. So I'm first going to make some mana. So I'm going to make 10 mana. Get, well, 5 mana, right? Put 10 mana in and use 5 of those mana to untap again. Oh, but now I've got Tron because of that, uh, wow, because of the tower. So now I'm making a lot of mana. Um, I've got 11 mana out of my Tron lands. No, 7 mana out of my Tron lands. 4 mana out of my lands. So 11 mana in total. Then I'm going to untap 5 of those mana. I think this is not correct. Anyway, during, according to my calculation, I had 9 mana left. I don't think that's right. To be honest, I think I had 11 minus 5, 6 mana left. 
So I think I'm making a mistake here. Either way, it would have been more than enough playing a trike. So that, I mean, my deck is kind of working on, on full cylinders right now. But it, I'm, I'm still not there where I want to be. Tapping four. Okay, there's a Blood Moon again. So my main reason to play this Blood Moon is so that the Setch Trolls, I'm pointing that out now as well, be, just become 2-2 two, two creatures without any regeneration. He doesn't have any black mana now. So it's really good for me. Attacking here with my one trike. Not... I, mm, I'm not sure if I like this. I guess I, I could do it because I'm not going to block on it anyway. Let's see what my opponent can do here. So, I mean, the problem now for me is that he still has both books. I am playing three Shatter's main. So if it can find a Shatter, I can just uh, take care of at least one book. And then we're even with the card draw. Because, I mean, he's drawing an extra card every turn. Finding a Plains. It's interesting, by the way, to see how many lands he's playing out because he is the one who plays with Armageddon's, right? So you would think he would be a bit more modest with the amount of lands that he's playing out, but maybe he's got his reasons. There we see a Soul Ring. Tapping the Soul Ring in a land. Gonna draw another card. I'm so jealous of his two books. And he still has the three planes and the one mountain there, but it's kind of like tucked away in the corner of the screen. And he wants to attack, tapping one of the trolls. I don't think he wants to attack with the other one, right? I mean, I can block, and then maybe if he bolts my trike in response, I can kill his other. Um, I can kill his other troll, so I think it's not really good for him to attack at this point. And what's important for me is not to be tempted now to use my counters. Okay, I think he's passing turn. Okay, this is good news. Untapping. Drawing for turn. I'm on 10. I mean, one of the problems here is that I've already lost so many good creatures. My Sheevan's in the bin. My Tetravis is in the bin. The Clockwork Avian's in the bin. I mean, I still have a few good creatures left, but they're not that many. I've got one Fireball left because it disintegrates also in the bin. I think that, that, that Wheel of Fortune did a lot of good for my opponent. Tapping lots of mana. I think tapping 11 mana, untapping it again. So I've got six left. And okay, playing a Lightning Bolt. And I'm going to draw a card. Oh, of course, now I've got 10 because the Blood Moon's back. Okay, so it's not. So it makes sense what I'm counting, by the way. Man, this is a bit complicated. Attacking with both here. Dealing 5 points of damage, so he's going to drop to 14. So it's looking pretty good at the moment. I can just tap down his Setch Troll next turn. Again, the only problem here are those two books. If he didn't have those two books, I would be way more confident, but the chance is so big that he's going to draw out of these problems. Killing the troll, I think this is unnecessary. This is unnecessary. This is not a good move. You can you can see that I'm playing this deck for the, for the first time. You know, I'm making silly mistakes. Which is, I mean, we're just playing, just to clarify, we're just playing a friendly game, but I just don't want to make any mistakes. Look at that. Now he can, oh, he's playing a bolt on me, seven. Oh, that is painful. And if he's bolting directly on me, maybe he's got more bolts in hand. That is so interesting. There is a balance. Oh, that Satch Troll was so bad. It was such a bad play. Mamma mia. Oh my goodness, what a bad play. Oh my goodness. Oh my, I'm, I think, I think... I gave away the game here with that Satch Troll move and why? I had an Icy, I could tap it down for days and days and days. In response of a Disenchant, I could still kill it before the Disenchant. You know, on my Blood Moon, there, there's, there's no reason, you know. Um, 
And this is why it's good that I look back at my own games to realize that um, I have a long way to go in this uh, in this format. Anyway, let's see, let's see what my opponent's gonna do. Is probably okay. Now he's gonna put some lands away because he's got less land than me. That doesn't really matter though. He's probably gonna draw from the book. And of course, he's going to keep his basic lands. That makes sense. He's going to draw a card. Oh, he's going to make more mana. Okay. I wonder what he's got in hand. He's going to make even more mana. Does he have maybe an Armageddon in hand that he wants to cast an Armageddon? First take all the mana out of his mana pool, cast an Armageddon, then draw the extra cards. Yeah, there's the Armageddon. Oh, this is bad news. At least I've got two mocks in, but this is so bad. Oh, man. This is, and, and really a nice play after the balance. Like with the balance, he lost tons of lands anyway. My creatures were gone. Oh, killing this Setch Troll was just bad. Why did I do it? Why did I do it? Anyway, uh, he's finding two new cards now. And there's Alliance. Oh, man. I mean, at least I can tap it down at something. So I'm going to tap it down and take my turn. Let's see what I can do. Let's hope I've got a land because then I already go back to four and I can start drawing some cards at least. Okay, so I'm going to make some mana again. I'm going to untap it. That means I've got one mana floating. Or not. Okay, for some reason using my mox. Why not? If you've got the mox, use it. Four mana, draw a card. Okay. And I still have one open to tap the lion next turn. So that's kind of nice. I need to rebuild. I mean, I'm not dead, but I could have gotten so much more out of that board state earlier. So now I'm going to tap down the lion, I guess. Remember, the factory is just a mountain because of the Blood Moon. Those books are doing so much work here. And I still cannot find a single Shatter. Three Shatter main, haven't found a single one. That can happen, of course. I think also my opponent has hardly found any disenchants. There's another one. I say it and it comes. It appears. Oh my goodness. And he's now drawing two extra cards. I'm going to tap the lion, but I mean, with the destruction of my, my tome here, I only play two now. They're, they're both gone, I think. And yeah, this is a big problem. Remember that workshop is also just, oh, this is interesting. What I'm doing here doesn't make sense. Oh, sorry. This was my first book still. What I'm doing here doesn't make sense. So, okay, so I've got four mana still, using four mana to play out the book. And then I can choose, am I going to draw an extra card or, or um, do I want to tap down the lion next turn? So going through my hand, trying to figure this out. Three cards in hand, it seems. So that was still my first book. Sorry, for a moment there, I thought it was already my second book on the board, but it was my first book still. Playing two books in this deck. So I'm on seven. I mean, I think I should just take the two damage and draw a card instead, to be honest, because it depends on what I've got in hand. Of course, maybe I already have a play next turn and I don't really, I'd rather just save two points of damage. Sometimes it can make all the difference. There's a granite gargoyle. Okay, so now it's kind of interesting. If it can tap down the line, it means I've got an extra turn. Although if I'm on five, yeah, I'm just going to take the damage. You're going to go to five. Oh, there's a disenchant. I'm going to use the books at least. At least I decided to keep the mana open to use the book one more time. That's good news instead of tapping down the line. So I'm on five now. Lost my second book. Tapping this for six. And I can use the candle lever to untap it again. So that means I've got three mana bonus. Oh, man. 
The problem is I've played out two trikes already, so I only have one more trike in my entire deck. Taking off the three. There's a Wheel of Fortune. That is kind of funny. Oh, man. And this is risky because I'm on five, but I'm right now I'm like, okay, I just need to play towards my outs. You saw my hand, a glass of Urza and two lands. So they were useless. So now I've got a fresh hand. My opponent's on 13. I mean, I first need to take care of those flyers because I'm on five. Okay, this is good. Tetravus. This is pretty sweet because I can use that to block the gargoyle. But of course, there's a pretty big chance that my opponent found something to take care of creatures. I just have to hope the best. There's a Mox Pearl. Tapping two here. What am I going to play? Ooh, finding a Shatter. That is at least something. Shattering one of the books. I think it's a too little too late, to be honest, but it's better than nothing. Having one Mox left there to activate the Icy next turn, that means I can tap down the line and block the Gargoyle, or of course do it the other way around. Tap the Gargoyle goyle and, um, and block the line. Maybe that's better because the Gargoyle can survive a block, the line cannot. So um, yeah, this, this, is, this is pretty interesting stuff here. But remember, my opponent now has a full hand and he still has one book left for an extra activation. I mean, this is super scary. Let's find out. Let's see what he's going to do. He's going to draw one. That's always a good sign because if he draws one, it kind of means that what's in his hand, his options are not that great. Or, or does he have a good, is it going to be in dust to dust? Oh, dusty dust. Oh, 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 oh no. Oh, 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 no. Oh, my hopes. Oh, my dreams. Oh, the dusty dust. It's such a good card, especially against my deck. I'm going to go to three right now. Dust to Dust has really killed me here. I've only got one turn left. I think what I need is a Fireball. If I've got a Fireball, I can actually kill him still. Wow, look at that. Two creatures. Because I think with Fireball, because I can make three. No, I cannot kill him with Fireball because he's on 13. I can generate 12 mana, I believe. Six, nine. Yeah, 12 mana. But then I have to cast a Fireball as well. If I can find a land. Okay, so now I should be able to make enough mana. So I'm going to tap everything. So that's 11 mana. Right? I'm going to untap. So that means I've got 11 takeaway 4. So I've got 7 left. I'm going to tap it again. Do I have... Oh, I don't have a fireball. No, 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 no. I was just... <laughs> I was just making my opponent nervous there because I actually had enough mana to, to deal the damage needed for a huge fireball. But... I didn't have it. I didn't have it. And man, what an interesting game one. And I've learned so much. And I can just advise everybody to record their games every once in a while and look back at them because it's super interesting. Anyway, this is just game one. We're going to sideboard and we'll catch back up with you in game number two. Game number two. Here we go. So I'm one game down, but I'm on the play at least. And let's have a look. Ooh, Mountain Yeti there on the hand. So that's what he boarded in from the sideboard. Ooh, and a Mishra's Factory, but that's his only land though. I wonder if he's gonna keep it. No, he's gonna shuffle it away. Makes sense. Only that one factory. The rest of the hand was pretty solid. Also that uh, Dust to Dust there, they did such a great job in game one. So he's gonna shuffle back up again. I wonder if I'm gonna keep my hand. I think I am. Hopefully I'm still gonna show it to the camera so we kind of have an idea what's in my opener. So he's drawing seven London Mulligan rules. So he needs to put one back if he wants to keep this. Okay, so he's going to keep. I'm getting my hand. I'm going to show my cards here. Ooh, that's Chaos Orb, I think. Oh, a Mox again and a Dwarven Weaponsmith. So I got Dwarven Weaponsmith turn one again. But I have to say the hand is looking pretty weak. Ooh, Soul Ring. That is good Mountain Yeti. And also what I really like here is that Wheel of Fortune because he's down a land okay, but he can quickly dump his hand and then cast Wheel of Fortune. 
That's actually pretty good. And here we have my opener again now with the Dwarven Weaponsmith turn one. It's what I do, baby. There is a Sol Ring turn one from you, Pierre. So next turn, no, Mountain Yeti is five mana. So he's got to wait one more turn. Gonna swing in for one here, playing a mountain. Probably gonna pass turn. Although I could play out my Chaos Orb. Probably gonna play Chaos Orb. Am I gonna flip it? Oh, of course I can flip it on the Soul Ring. That's exactly what I'm gonna do. Want to slow my opponent down here. So let's see if this is gonna be a hit. Yep, that's a hit. Pretty good flip, if I say so myself. Soul Ring is a goner. So I want to slow my opponent down. Hopefully. I can draw into something. Remember, my entire hand was just mana sources, except for the Weaponsmith and uh, the, um, the Chaos Orb. So attacking again, finding a Mishra's Factory. That's not too bad. can turn that sideways. And what are we going to do? Ooh, there's a Satchtroll. That's actually a 3-3 now, because he has access to Badlands. That is bad news for me. I mean, he is taking a risk here because he doesn't keep a black open to regenerate. So if I have a lightning bolt, I can take care of it. Unfortunately, I don't. So that's pretty bad news. Finding another Badlands. And oh, there's the Mountain Yeti. So Mountain Yeti is four to cast. Sorry, not five. I think I said five earlier, but it's four. Two red and two for a three, three with Mountain Walk and protection from red. Tapping six. Am I gonna find... Ooh, Shivan Dragon! That is sweet! Somewhere I was hoping for a trike, but Shivan is even better. I can start attacking big time. That is pretty cool. Yeah, pointing out the Shivan. Really looking forward. Hopefully my opponent doesn't have a Swords to Plowshares. He's got a white source now. Well, he already had actually, because there's a plateau there on the battlefield as well. And he's going to attack with both creatures. Am I going to block? That's the question. I am not. I'm just going to take the damage. Don't want to take the risk of running into a lightning bolt and lose my Sheevan Dragon. Am I now going to use my Dwarven Weaponsmith? I think I should. Yeah, I'm going to sack the Mox. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So what happens now? Plus one, plus one counter on my Sheevan Dragon. It is now a 6-6, six, six, ladies and gentlemen. This is... The Weaponsmith in action, I can attack with my factory as well, and I can deal some serious damage. The problem is I'm taking six damage back as well. That's a big problem, but I can deal more damage in a six. Gonna attack, gonna pump it to nine, dealing nine. Oh, no, just dealing eight points of damage. So I'm on 14, and my opponent's down to 10. What am I going to do? What else can I do? I mean, a Blood Moon would be nice right now because it's going to take at least a Setch Troll kind of offline. But I'm doing nothing so far. Maybe a Bolt on the Yeti would be really sweet. And I really hope that my Sheevan is going to survive here. There is a Strip Mine. So he's on 10. Ooh, he's going to do something. He's going to cast a Wheel of Fortune. In response, do I have a Bolt here? Yes, Bolting the Yeti. That is actually pretty good. Discarding a land and drawing seven new. The problem here is, and of course, this is why Yoop is playing it. He wants his swords. He needs to kill my Sheevan. And there's a pretty big chance that he'll find the one white to kill the Sheevan here. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, that, that was to be expected. At least I got to swing in once. I'm gaining six life from it, going back up to 20. That's something. And it was really, really cool to use my Dwarven Weaponsmith and make it into a 6-6 six, six flyer. And he's passing turn, so I'm going to untap here. Going through the motion... I don't have Tron yet because I've got two mines and a tower. Going back to my hand though, no, just playing the mine. Don't have a power plant. I wonder what I can do. I mean, I can't really attack here. There's a 3-3 Sedge. Ooh, tapping four. Is there maybe... Ooh, there's an Icy. 
tapping down the set quite aggressive here and i'm gonna swing in for three so i'm gonna try to put him on seven does he have a disenchant or anything else no he does not so he's gonna go to seven i mean it makes sense i'm on 20 so i can take a hit there's a disenchant on the icy manipulator I am so close right now. I can smell the victory. If he's got an Armageddon, though, that would be really bad for me right now. So we'll just have to wait and see. Oh, he's tapping six. Okay, what's he going to cast? Ooh, Armageddon. Oh, this is so bad. This is so bad. Oh man, this is such a well-timed Armageddon. And another set because he still had mana floating from that Armageddon there. You know, he tapped his always lands first, so he's in his main phase, used four lands of that to cast Armageddon. And yeah, I'm asking about it, but he had more than enough. And uh, okay, at least finding a land. Candelabra of Ton is nice with one land. That's that's ideal. That's perfect. At least what I can do is I can I can make a counter out of the Candelabra. Out of the candlestick, I can make a weapon. There's the attack. At least there's still two twos, so it's not too bad. Gonna drop to 16. And uh, it looks like he's gonna pass here. Or not, it's, it's a bit unclear. Okay, so he's gonna pass. So I'm actually gonna sack my candlestick to make my dwarf a two two. That's funny. Have you ever seen that happen this is a first for me but uh, i have to say it's such a joy to play with the weaponsmith it's such an epic card i just really really love the art i love what it does it's super fun to play anyway taking four damage gonna go down to 12 gonna untap i think i remember this i think i've got a lot of burn in hand and what i need is a red source if i can find a red source i can create some hammock but i need a red source though That is the problem. Attacking again. So I'm going to block one set. I'm going to go down to 10. Oh, there's a gargoyle. Oh, this is really bad. I need a red source. I think I've got a bolt and maybe a chain lightning in hand. I remember boarding in two chain lightnings. I've got two chains in the sideboard. I don't play the main. I also have two mazes in the sideboard. Wow, going to go to six. I didn't board in the mazes, by the way, because I'm playing against. Okay, there's a soaring. There's nothing. I need red mana. But what I wanted to say is I didn't board in the mazes because I'm playing against Armageddon's. There is a disenchant. So I figured I'm just going to board in the, um, the chain lightnings because they're quite good because there are a lot of like smaller creatures in the deck of Yoop. And you can see one chain lightning here would be quite good, although it's too late now. I'm on two. There's nothing I can do. No red source. Okay, sharing my hand here. Look at this. Bolt, bolt, chain, bolt. My god, I had enough burn to kill him, but I just didn't have the red mana. Ho oh, ho! Okay, there was a ruby, but it's too little too late. Man, I was so close. That means it's a 2 0. Yoop, you've won this, but don't worry, you don't have to click away because we played a third match. And you know what? I'm going to show you, uh, sorry, a third game, and I'm going to show you that game. And uh, it's too bad, though, because I felt in both games that I was quite close to the victory. Of course, you, well done, man. All the kudos to you that, that, that Armageddon was timed perfectly. But um, I'm just going to shuffle up and hope for the best in game number three. Game number three. Here we go. So I've already lost this one, but hopefully I can make it better. Um, or I mean, I can at least win one game. There's Chaos Orb. I see. It looks pretty good. Not too many lands. No Moxon as well, so... There's the hand of my opponent, Yoop, again. Ooh, again, only a factory is only mana source. I mean, there's a Felber Stone, but yeah, we shuffle this away as well. So again, he's got to take a mulligan. I mean, he's on the draw, so I always find it kind of easier to take a mole when I'm on the draw. Maybe that shouldn't influence me too much, but I notice that I personally am more tempted to take a uh, mulligan when I'm on the draw. Because you know you're at least going to draw a card back. So he's going to look at 7 again. Let's hope for a Yoop that it's good enough to keep now. Because you don't want to go down that road of mulling again. 
Ooh, he's got a mulligan though. Oh, that is painful. So he's got to go down to five cards. Wow. So we haven't even started, but already it's looking pretty good for me because he's got to go down to five. And, uh, you know, you just want to play a game where you both have a good hand and you can just both keep in play. That's that's most fun. It's not fun when your opponent has to go down to five. Then again, it's a nice challenge for him. Maybe he can keep a hand with the Wheel of Fortune in it. We've seen a lot of Wheel of Fortunes in this match thus far. So he's going to put two on the bottom. He's going to keep. And uh, that means we're going to start. I'm starting here with the Mox Pearl. Oh, I did have a Mox. Okay. Starting with Chaos Orb turn one. Interesting choice to play it out at turn one. I'm kind of telling, giving my opponent a window to destroy it. So he's playing his plateau. I wonder if I'm going to flip on the plateau. No, I'm going to use a strip mine. That is even better. That means I can kind of focus on his mana base. Passing the turn here. I wanted to say without playing a land, but of course the strip mine was a land drop. And playing an Urza's Mine. Am I going to flip here? Now he's showing his hand. Oh, that's actually pretty decent. He's got that Soul Ring. I'm going to flip. Assuming that he doesn't have a lot of lands because he kept a five-hander. But, I mean, it's not too bad here for my opponent. He can play the land, tap it, play Soul Ring. Next turn, play Gargoyle. There is a Shatter, though. So I'm really trying to attack his mana base. Playing a Mox, stepping four. Okay, playing an Icy. So with that Icy, I can start tapping down his lands as well, really trying to slow him down. He's playing another Plateau, so now I can start tapping down another Mana Source. Playing a Candelabra, tapping down his Plateau in passing turn. There is another land here for my opponent. So despite the Strip Mine, Chaos Orb, and Shatter all on Mana Sources, he's actually doing quite well. And I'm not tapping down his factory, tapping down a land instead, probably because I've got a Shatter in hand. So I'm trying to kind of tempt him into attacking for two here. He's not doing it though. And tapping five, will we see? There is a Clockwork Avian, the 4 4 flyer from Antiquities. Oh, met by a quick swords to plowshare. So I'm going to go up to 24. And now he has the uh, space to cast a gargoyle that he's had in hand for longer. Finding another mox. So now I've got six mana. Can I find a Tetravis or a Triskelion? Fireball for two here. Really want to take care of that flyer. Passing turn. Tapping down the plateau. And I mean, it's kind of interesting. Like, I'm able to control the situation, but... Then again, my opponent is also um, in a pretty decent state. I have a small card advantage because he, of course, started with just five cards in hand after the double mulligan. And now he can just untap, only have that one IC to tap down the gargoyle. So it looks like he's going to animate the factories, or at least one. Both of the factories, he's going to attack with both. I'm going to play a Shatter on one of them. Going to take two damage. Going to go to 22. After taking those lives earlier from the um, Clockwork Avian. Look at that. We're playing quite fast here. Killing the Gargoyle on the spot. Tapping down a land of his again. So I'm really trying to make it hard for him to cast anything right now. I'm really trying to... To be the control player here, taking care of the lance, stepping down the lance. There's a bolt. So dealing one damage, of course. That's too bad. And now I'm in top decking mode. And okay, finding... Oh, just too late. Just too late. That is unfortunate. That is really, really unfortunate. Tapping down the land again. So he can at least swing in for two if he wants to. And that's what he does. So I'm going to go to 20. I'm going to untap. Tapping down the land again. So I'm just really trying to control this game. One card in hand. 
Tapping three. Okay, there's a Setch Troll. So it's a 3-3 three, because three, he's got black mana. Putting the Setch Troll in the coffin. Going to untap again so it comes back tapped. Looks like I've got something or not. Okay, now I've got Tron. Tapping six. Going to play a Tetravis. That is pretty good news. I can now put the Tetravis in the coffin. Oh, I'm not discovering... <laughs> I'm not discovering my uh, my Candelabra of Tannis. So I'm making basically 9 mana, and then I can use 4 to untap, so I've got 5 left, and then I can, yeah, use 5 mana and 1 to cast the Tetravis. Yeah, I can do that. It doesn't change much because I've got no cards in hand, so not really anything to do with all that extra mana, but it's still kind of nice. It's pretty cool to see Candelabra doing so much work in this match. And now we just have to wait and see. The problem for me here is if I put Tetravis in the coffin in the end step, so tapping down the Sedge, if I put it in the coffin in the end step, I've got the risk that in response my opponent will play a Swords on it, on my Tetravis, and I will lose it. So I probably don't want to do that. So now I'm going to take the counters off. So I've got... 3 1 1 Tetravites, 3 1 1 Flyers. But it looks like my opponent wants to respond on that move. So I'm saying I'm going to take 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters off. And my opponent is saying I would like to respond to that. So let's see what he's going to do. So it looks like he wants to play a Swords to Plowshares. In response, I'm going to put it in the coffin. In response, oh, he's going to disenchant. This is bad. So how it works now, because we had a little discussion, I remember this. He disenchants the coffin while the coffin trigger is still on the stack. So that means that the um, the Tetravis gets exiled from the game because of the coffin. But because the coffin is not there anymore, it's not coming back. So I'm not gaining any life. And my Tetravis is gone. It's out of the game. This is horrible. This is horrible for me. I mean, the only good news is here, it's two cards for two cards, but it's super bad because, you know, Taunus' Coffin is like an all-star card in my deck. Oh, man. Anyway, making some mana again, it seems. And I'm going to cast something. Okay, it's a book. That is pretty decent. Drawing a card. That's, that's pretty good. And I'm probably just going to pass here unless I found something useful. Uh, but it's just really bad losing that Thomas's Coffin. I think very well played by, uh, by my opponent here. Really knowing what he was doing. He really waited for me to activate the Coffin. Oh, this is bad. Armageddon! Man, Armageddon is good against my deck. That card is... I already knew it. I said it in the deck deck. It's not a surprise, but... It's just really good. I mean, I'm playing, of course, with, with Tron. I'm playing with Mana Flare. I mean, I need my lands. At least finding one here. Now I've got enough mana to use the book, which is not too bad. I'm still on 20. My opponent's on 19. We're actually pretty high up in life. They're, these are quite interesting matches, if I say so myself. Let me know in the comments below um, if, you, if you've enjoyed these matches. I know it's quite long, but... I'm really liking looking back at it. So he's going to attack. I'm going to take the damage because I want to draw a card. So I'm just tapping four to draw a card there. So basically, I'm paying three life to draw a card. That's how I'm looking at it. I'm still pretty high up in my life total. So going to use it again, trying to find a land for a land drop potentially. I mean, remember, my deck needs kind of six to kind of play out the bigger creatures. The Tetravis and the Trikes, at least five. Then I get access to Clockwork Avian. I haven't seen a Dwarven Weaponsmith, by the way, in this uh, last game. And more damage is dealt. I'm dropping to 14. Again, I'm going to draw a card. Problem is, I cannot keep doing this because I, I probably have a handful of red cards, right? Going to drop to 11. I mean, this is tough. 
going for my hand again. Okay. Ooh, look at that hand. I think this Wheel of Fortune is not too bad for me. I mean, I was going nowhere. I do understand it from my opponent's point of view as well. And of course, a Wheel of Fortune is just fun. <laughs> I mean, remember, we're. I mean, this is kitchen table we're playing right now. Um, but that doesn't mean that you want to, you know, play the correct place. You don't want to make a mistake, kitchen table or not. Okay, finding a workshop, tapping four here. Casting another Icy. That's actually pretty good. I can start tapping down his land. So I guess I'm going to tap down his red source, I think. That's probably the best. Right? I think I think I should tap the red. You, you would think it makes sense, but I think he's he's not playing. I didn't see the deck list, but it, based on what I've seen, I'm like, okay, he's not playing with Demonic Tutor or Twist. So I'm just going to tap down his one red sword. It's now finding a bad land, so it doesn't really matter. Oh, no! The dust to dust again. He's going to go for the book. And he's going to go for the icy. Right? No, he's going to go for the candelabra. Okay, so at least... At least that's something. But with the candelabra, of course, he knows I can, I can use that workshop twice and I can start casting my bigger creatures. Oh, man. I mean, he knows that, yes, an Icy is good, but it's only defense. So, you know, where the, the Gem Day Tome and potentially the Candelabra can, can make sure that I can play creatures or draw into creatures that make me win the game. The problem is that, again, I've hardly dealt any damage here. I'm on 11. He's on 19. Playing another land. And again, I don't have any red mana, by the way. Tapping down the Sedge, he's playing the Mountain Yeti. Really nice to see the Mountain Yeti in action, by the way. Yeah, this is tough, because now what I'm going to do now is just tapping down the creatures. That's it. Okay, finding a Mox Ruby. At least I'm finding my Moxon. What I need right now is a big beefy creature like a Trike and a Dwarven Weaponsmith. That would be kind of sweet. And I can start putting, turn those Moxon into counters on the Trike to start shooting his creatures. That would be awesome if I could if I could do that. If I could show that here in game number three, that would kind of be the dream. Although I have to admit, I've done some pretty cool plays already looking back at this match. And look at that. I'm actually tapping down a land. That is interesting. Why am I doing that? I wonder why. I think it would make more sense just tap down the creatures at this point. I mean, I'm on 11 already. I mean, what am I trying to stop here? I wonder. Because he's got enough land to still cast like an Armageddon or whatever. An Armageddon is not even a problem right now. Okay, there's a bolt on the Yeti. So maybe that's why I tapped the land because I had that bolt anyway. There's another Yeti though. More Mountain Yetis! Really cool to see that uh, you boarded those in. I think they're quite good against my deck. And, oh yeah, this doesn't really matter. I mean, it takes care of one land, it's something. So these cards come from the sideboard. Flash fires destroys all planes. I mean, it, it can be pretty decent. Tapping down the creatures. There's another Mountain Yeti. Come on. That's Mountain Yeti number three. I think that's all his Mountain Yetis he's played out right now. I need more bolts, people. I don't need a Sol Ring. <laughs> I don't need that. I don't need a Sol Ring. There's his Shatter. Okay, so I'm still kind of trying to attack his mana base. I've, I've been trying to do that from the start, but it's not working. But I'm not giving up. <laughs> a for effort. Oh, man. And he's just going to attack. I can I can tap down two Yetis, right? But I still take three from the set. Going to go to eight. Ooh, there's a Jam Day Tome. That is really good. That is really good. Kind of put, making sure it's on camera. Remember, he's playing four Jam Day Tomes. I have to say, I'm kind of liking these Jam Day Tomes in the deck. I first, when I looked at the deck, I'm like, Armageddon and Jam Day Tome, that doesn't work together. But it actually does. 
I mean, I have to say he is playing against a pretty slow deck. My deck, you know, the Dwarven Workshop deck is not the quickest. Tapping down two more, taking three, going to go down to five. I mean, this is looking bad for me. Again, I look at the life of my opponent. He's still on, well, not on 20, he's on 19, but <laughs> fully dealt one point of damage. That's not very impressive at all. Tapping six. Ooh, Sheevan Dragon. Wow. At least I'm able to cast a Sheevan Dragon in every single game. So I'm really happy with that. And he doesn't have any white mana to play a Swords on it. This is actually quite interesting. I can tap down the Setch, tap down the Mountain Yeti, or actually I should tap down the two Mountain Yetis because they've got Mountain Walk and then it can block the Setch. I mean, and then if he's got the Bolt, okay, I lose to Sheevan, but I mean, I'm on five. I cannot take three damage. I don't have Tron yet, by the way. Those are two power plants and a tower, so I need a mine still. There's a Felwer Stone. Interesting that he chooses to play a Felwer Stone. Another Felwer Stone, because you would think maybe he would choose just to draw uh, an another card from the Gem de Tome. Then again, he knows if he attacks. Is he not even going to... Ooh, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that he's not even attacking. I would have expected him to attack just to bluff. You know, I would block, he could regenerate. Yeah, he's doing that. So I'm blocking, he's regenerating. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So what do I have now? I've got that soaring for my two ICs, and I've got a lot of lands. The question is, do I have anything useful? The problem is, if I attack... I mean, I'm not dead. I could go to two, but then I'm in bolt range. Don't want to get in bolt range. And I don't have... The thing is, I don't have enough red to deal 10 damage or at least 9 damage. If if I would have had enough to like, pump it to a 10-5, I would say, you know what? I'm just going to play to my outs and I'm going to try to get two swings. Ooh, fireball, it's over. It's over. Ah, Man, this is so annoying. I felt... Okay, in game three, I wasn't really that close, but I felt there were options in every single game. Let me know in the comments below what you think of uh, my deck, the uh, the Dwarven Workshop, and um, if you like it as well. Maybe I'm the only one because it's my build. I'm like, oh, I like my deck so much. And you're looking at this thinking, dude, you just lost all three games in a row. It's really poor. But in all honesty, I think it's more my poor play, especially in that game one, people you know that that got me to a 3-0 loss then that's then that it is the deck itself obviously it may need some tweaking let me know in the comments below what you would add or change or take out or whatever you can see the deck here on the screen uh please let me know i would appreciate your feedback and of course a big thumbs up to Yoop Vok for uh, winning this man three games in a row your deck's on fire and i have to say I'm surprised because like I said in the deck deck, I see some mid game elements, some control elements and some aggro elements and somehow they seem to work together really well. Um, you know, you play your arm again in, in a very controlling fashion and uh, yeah, it seems to work well for you. Jam day tome and, and, and arm again and together in a deck who knew that it could work so, so well. For now, um, this is it. I want to thank you for watching. Uh, it's, it's been a long episode. <laughs> I'm sorry for that, but these games just took long and they were a lot of fun to play. A shout out to Robert from um, The Vendetta, the game store, the LGS in Hilversum, where we actually played these matches. It's really a cool place. So if you're ever in Hilversum, make sure to visit The Vendetta that's in the Netherlands. Just to clarify, it's pretty close to Amsterdam where I live. And uh, it's the LGS where uh, where my brother Yup always goes to. So we had some games there. It was uh, it was tons of fun. So thank you, Robert, for uh, hosting us there. And um, yeah, that's about it. So before you go, I always forget this. But before you go, please consider liking this video, sharing this video on your socials, and leaving a comment down below. All this really really helps uh timmy talks move forward and it's all free and only takes a minute so i would really appreciate it uh, if you could leave a like and a comment and if you're new to the channel welcome here to timmy talks please consider becoming a subscriber and ring that bell and then there is one thing that you can do and that is you can become a patron of this show as well and that means you can sponsor me my channel 
financially and uh, your money is going to go to the channel to keep the channel afloat you know um, so that would really be appreciated if you would consider becoming a patron on patreon it's only one dollar a month at, well, it starts with $1. You can, of course, choose a different tier if you want to. But for that $1, you already get access to the Timmy Talks Discord. You can play in all the Timmy Talks online tournaments. And your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. What end scroll? This end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? 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 Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazink.